want to encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews and James is the next verse. Hebrews is a pretty uh, substantial book in the Bible. It comes uh, at the end of uh, the letters of Paul. Some people think Paul wrote it. I think, uh, I think Apollos wrote it. How about that for a, a good word in here? I'll tell you one thing, based on the Greek language, there's no way Paul wrote it. How about that? All right. You have to research that. Take you hours and hours. I had to write a research paper on it, so I believe it wholeheartedly. All right. What we're doing today, next Sunday, September 4th, and next Sunday, September 11th, we are getting ready for uh, a church-wide effort. We're calling Be the Church. And I really felt, as, as I looked at these Sundays, that... The steps over these next three weeks are really important to be ready, to prepare our hearts, to, to get some things fitted rightly in our spirits, to be able to take uh, fullest advantage uh, of what God is setting before us here. So, we'll start that journey today in Hebrews 10. How many of you ever audited a class in college? Anybody? Several? Okay, yeah. Uh, when someone audits a class, it, it means they're, they're, they go to the lectures, receive the teaching, uh, but rather than being evaluated, getting course credit, they just want to be introduced to the subject, be exposed to the subject, something they're interested in, something they're curious about, uh, but no need for uh, or desire for academic credit. So you audit a class. And I think these days, that's a pretty good illustration for a lot of folks in church, is that too many people are just auditing church. They come... But, but they're not really engaged in the process. It's not for, for purpose so much as just maybe interest or casual uh, questions that may arise. Sporadic, in, inconsistent attendance, in, inconsistent involvement, inconsistent commitment, engagement, uh, characterize church life these days. Too many people, I think, they, they use, and our phrasing reveals some of this, I go to church, I attend church, I'm a member of a church. But see, the Bible didn't call us to that kind of casual engagement. The Bible calls us to be the church. And that means an, an immersion in, in the body of Christ, to be a part of this family, more than casual interest. A lot of people... They're just not the church, auditing, watching from a distance. Uh, well, that, I thought about this this morning. He's still one of my favorite people ever, and I like to make fun of him. Uh, Marlon Perkins. How do you remember Marlon Perkins, Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom? You know why you know that? Because you're old, like me. <laughs> That's why you know who Marlon Perkins is. That's the only way you would have that information tucked away. And it was before there, were, there was an animal channel and all that stuff, there was Marlon Perkins and Wild Kingdom uh, sponsored by Mutual of Omaha Insurance. And Marlon was 100 years old. Now, theoretically, he knew a lot about animals. But every episode worked about the same. They'd go out into the savanna of the Serengeti, and here are all these animals, and, and Marlon would say, all right, there's the rhino who needs to have his teeth brushed. Now, he, Marlon had a partner. Remember, what's his partner's name? Jim. Oh, poor Jim. Because when these, when these situations arose, this is, this is how it plays out. Marlon says, while I watch from the safety of the Land Rover, Marlon is going to wrestle this rhinoceros to the ground and brush its teeth. And then Marlon just go running out across the savanna and tackle a rhinoceros and brush its teeth. And while Marlon comments on it from the safety of the Land Rover. And I think and when it comes to Christian life, I think a lot of people are just way back saying, well, I'm not really engaged in this. I, I'm just watching from the safety of the Land Rover. I'm keeping a safe distance from actually being, being in the game. A lot of people playing church games and consumers of spiritual products, but that's not what Jesus died for. That, that's not what 
what the Bible's called us to be as, as the church. You know, in times like these, and my goodness, the times, uh, the world is a scary place, and the challenges are great. And in, in this generation, we have been called out, privileged to be the church in this generation, in these times. And, and I'll tell you, these times, I wish I could say, and soon it'll all be better. But you know what? The Bible says it's not going to get better. In fact, times will get worse before they get better, uh, before Jesus comes again. And we just can't do casual Christianity. And we can't do lazy discipleship. It was a hard time when the book of Hebrews gets written. Uh, the people were experiencing uh, a lot of pressure. And persecution had, had begun to stir in the Roman Empire. And it was hard to be a Christian. And in that environment, this is what Paul, uh, not Paul, Apollos, wrote, I believe, to, to God's people. And he wrote it then, and he writes it for us today. I'm going to start back in verse 19, although uh, primarily we'll be considering the last couple of verses that I'm going to read. Here's what he says. As he's talked about the difficulties, the challenges, that's what he's been doing through the whole letter so far. And then he says, therefore, brothers. Now, when he says brothers, he doesn't just mean you guys. You ladies will get off the hook on this one. He means brothers, sisters, those who are the, the ones who belong to Jesus Christ. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, not just a temple in Jerusalem anymore, but we have access to the heavenly throne room because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, talking about Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. You hang in there, he says. That's a big purpose of this little book of Hebrews. And verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another. And I love that that image. We'll spend some time with that image during our Be the Church campaign. Consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as some as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, the day, the day when Jesus comes again, drawing near. Now, what are you looking for in a church? What is a church supposed to be? What does it mean to be a church? And, and people come up with all kinds of definitions. We, we define everything in life. We want to define church too. Everyone has expectations. Some people come to, to a place like this and say, I want to be a part of a small church. And this is a big church. And we talk about the church gets smaller as you get into a group. And, but some people say, no, I want to walk into the building and I know everybody that's going to be there, everybody who was there last week, everybody who will be there probably next week. I want to recognize every face. That's, that's church for me. Other people say, I want a large church with lots of different things for my family, for, for me, opportunities for growth and uh, experiencing God. I want a large church. Some people say, I want a church that sings the music I like. On the Sundays I happen to be there. I don't care what you sing the other Sundays, but on the Sundays I be there, I want you to be singing my playlist. Some people say, I want a church that says there's thermostat to my unique body comfort level. Right? Amen? Are you out there? I want a church where everyone notices me, but not too much, not too little. Just at the exact right amount of noticing that I can handle. That's what I'm looking for in a church. I was talking to a pastor the other day who had someone who sent him an angry note. I'm leaving your church because I don't like your coffee. And I visited another church and I like their coffee better. And I'm going to their church. Everybody's got their thing. I want a church that's tailored to my preferences. I want a church that's customized to my specifications uh, it works, works like my cell phone. Well, it, it's, it's me. 
that thing is tailored to me just the way I want it to be. It rings the way I want it to ring. It shows what I want it to show. And I want my church experience to be the same way, tailored just for me. Now, if you start this conversation about church and me is, is where you start the, the conversation, you're probably going to end up at the wrong place every time. It's a big deal. False teaching is a big, it was a big deal in the, in the New Testament period, in the first century. It's a big deal today. Our trouble is that, that that false way of thinking about the church and what a church is and what a church is to be is coming from a well-meaning group of people who say, Jesus is my Savior, and I, I believe He died on the cross for my sin. It, it's common to say, I love Jesus. I believe the Bible. But but here's how I think the Christian life ought to work. Here's how I think God ought to do His job. Here's how I think a church uh, should work to fit my need at every turn. You know, and in the end, truth, right and wrong, are whatever people want them to be. It's we're self-defining what is truth, and we're self-defining what's right and what's wrong. And one popular church leader, and this is a, a prominent voice in the prosperity gospel movement, which is probably worldwide is the largest false teaching that exists. Uh, it, it is a it is a terrible thing in Central and South America. It's a terrible thing on the African continent, and it's a terrible thing in these United States of America. And one uh, this this particular leader says. It defines happiness and success in terms of earthly blessings. That happiness and success, that's what it's all about. It's all about right now. Your best life is going to be right now. Better job, better house, stronger marriage, better health. Uh, even uh, in uh, one book said, just knowing you'll get a better parking space at a crowded mall. That's, all, that's what the Christian life is all about. And even people who have been in Bible-believing churches for their whole lives start thinking, well, that sounds pretty good. Cut me a piece of that pie. It always works out for me. Everything's always up and to the right. Everything's good. Uh, God's job is to make me happy. I like that idea. And then the question becomes, I want a church that, that does that for me. I want a church that says, I'm always going to win. I want a church that says, God wants ultimately for me to always be happy and for everything to work out. Or, if it doesn't, I just won't go anymore. If life gets difficult, I'm going to assume God let me down, that the church let me down if I have difficulty in my life. It's like a lucky rabbit's foot. You say, my religion, my my sense of relationship to God and relationship to churches, it's a lucky rabbit's foot. And when it stops being lucky, I'm going to chunk it. I won't need it anymore. Now, this flows out of a widespread belief system. The Barna Group did a study. And uh, I'm going to touch on some things I have touched on before. It's been about three years. And I assume you don't remember what I talked about last week, much less three years ago. So this will probably be really fresh for you. Uh, today, today's a lot of axioms. Axioms are you know, teaching truths, things we say a lot at our church. You're going to get a lot of axiom today. I have not used this phrase in uh, uh, almost uh, about two, two and a half years. It's one of my favorites. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. It's the most common religion in these United States of America. And it permeates across denominations, across age groups, and uh, across our land. Here's the idea, and this from an extensive national survey. Basic ideas of moralistic therapeutic deism. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and really in most all world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when needed to resolve a problem. Now, this is a key part of the moralistic therapeutic deism. It's uh, like uh, you're... You go out to eat, 
and it's, it's August in Texas, and you have drained your glass of tea sitting at your uh, table at your favorite restaurant. So you, you wave down that waiter. Over here, I need a refill. And the waiter comes over, says, yeah, what can I do for you? I need a refill. Great, is everything else? I don't need to visit. I just need you to take care of what needs to be taken care of. That's, that's the way a lot of people treat God. Just come, fix a problem, scoot on out. And then good people go to heaven when they die. And that's moralistic, therapeutic deism. It teaches the central goal of life is to be good and to be happy. Be a good moral person. Be nice, kind, pleasant, respectful, responsible. Uh, the, the sense of religion is on try to be a good person, a nice person. Which means you... you uh, you don't want to stir and stir and stir the pot too much. You don't want to tell someone else they're wrong or that there's something that's sin because that could hurt someone's feelings and that wouldn't be nice. So you'd rather they just go on to hell lost, I guess, than to hurt their feelings. That's the moralistic side. Then there's the therapeutic side. The therapeutic side is is about providing therapeutic benefits to its inher its adherents. It's like. Uh, little counsel for you, a little encouragement for you, make you feel better about things. Uh, one person described it this way. People see it as the, the crutch they use when they need a crutch. That's the therapeutic side of this. It's not a, a faith that involves repentance of sin or serving a sovereign almighty God or of passionate prayer or faithful service to God, building character through suffering, basking in God's love and grace, spending your life in gratitude and love for the cause of reaching lost people, caring for broken people, helping lonely people. And I think it describes most people in our country who would attend any church, any age group, and <laughs> they'd still really believe I want, this is, this, is what, this is what I think the Christian life should be. I want me and my family to be good people, and I want us to be happy, and I want us to be safe. Want to be good, want to be happy, want to be safe. This is why you should be glad you're in this service and not in the next. Because good, happy, and safe is what's most often reflected in our prayers, isn't it? Isn't that what consumes us? You know, you're going to, here's what I tell you. You're going to go to your Bible fellowship groups. There are going to be people coming out of, the, out, of, out of this hour here who spent their whole time praying that they would all be good, happy, and safe. And they're going to come in here. They're going to feel really bad when they get to this part of the sermon. You, on the other hand, will be able to temper that some, tap the brakes. Now, if you have some folks in your class who can't make it to worship because they're just too sleepy to get here at 9 o'clock, they're going to feel really bad, and you are free to make fun of them. In the name of the Lord. <laughs> but, see, that's not a happy, nice, and safe. It's not a biblical worldview. When, when, man, and it's tempting. I know, I know. I want to pray that for my kids. But I pray that for my college-age kids. And what I've said is, dear God, please don't let my children ever grow spiritually. Because if you're always those three things, you're never going to grow spiritually. Because spiritual growth happens not in a hot house, but it happens uh, in a real life world. That's where spiritual growth takes place. I heard, uh, heard a guy pick this up out of an article. Uh, he said, if someone asked you to describe church, just using the Bible, not your experiences, not your preferences, not your opinions, but just the Bible, how would you describe church? What would you say? Well, we need to start there, and the reason is if you don't start with God's Word, you're going to start creating things that consumer stuff. Here's what I want. Here's my checklist of all the things I want in my church. I want this. I want that. He compares it to this, that you, you say, you know, I think, I think what God wants from me, because I really love this, and I think God would love it too, is Spaghetti. I think God wants the greatest bowl of spaghetti that's ever been made. And I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to making the greatest bowl of spaghetti that anyone's ever seen. 
And you spend your whole life making your bowl of spaghetti and tweaking the recipe. And one day you stand before Almighty God and say, God, here's my bowl of spaghetti. And God says, I don't even do pasta. I didn't ask you for a bowl of spaghetti. I asked you for your life laid down for the one Jesus Christ who laid down his life for you. Now, what we're going to explore in this new series is how to be the church. And we're going to do it together as a church family because when we do stuff together, we focus all of us in the same direction at the same time. God has done some really great things among us, and that's why we like to do these things uh, just about on an annual basis here at the church. And why is this a big deal? Because otherwise, if we don't, if we don't found it, if we, can, if we can tune everybody in the same direction, then we're not firing off in 20 different directions. Just say, this is what a church is. This is what relationship to God should look like. And when we do it together, we stop making things up. And that's what cults do. Cults make stuff up. They construct a God in their own image and false teaching begins to creep in. But see, God has made, has made himself, his will, and his ways clear and revealed in his word. And so we're going to focus on that. What is a church supposed to be like? All right, here come some things that I say when I talk about the church. The church is the only organization that's not completely concerned with the kingdom of this earth. I mean, all the others are focused on this side. See, the church is the only one that's focused on the other dimension. And there are all kinds of good concerns around us that are not our primary concern. There's th certain things that are important in the world, certainly. But they don't have to be the main important thing at the church because there's certain things that are important at church that nobody else is ever going to care about. The greatest danger for an organization, for a church organization, is to take on things that don't fit its purpose. There is nothing wrong with social and civic clubs, but the church is not a social, civic club, uh, service club. The church is not a country club. Nothing wrong with a country club, but that's not what a church is. Lots of folks want the church to duplicate things that other organizations do. You'd be amazed at how often uh, we're contacted here at the church asking us to do things uh, we're often, come, come and do this with us. Come help us. with. Now, you can't talk about Jesus. You can't talk about the Bible. You can't talk about even what the, what the Bible says about life. Okay, well, that's probably not something we're going to be a part of. That's, uh, other people can do that, and, but that, that's not the mission of the church because nobody else is going to do what the church does. We're the church, and that means there are certain things we value and certain things that are are not of value to anybody else. And that's where we focus. Our focus has to be on this message of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and was raised from the dead that God has entrusted to us. And we're not going to shelve that to chase other rabbits. The ultimate goal of Christianity is not to make us good citizens or to make us nice people. The goal is to make us revolutionaries in the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it's a big calling. We, we want to... One of my favorite descriptions of being a Christian and being the church is we want to take an atheist and we want to turn him into a missionary. We want to take people far from God and make them fully devoted, fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what we're about in the church. So it's a lot bigger. We want to see the world transformed. And to reach that, we're going to have to do some things differently maybe than we've been doing because we are... As the church in the United States, we're perfectly fitted to get the results we're getting, right? You got your business guys know that. That whatever is happening, that's what you're positioned, that's what you're structured, that's what you're planning to happen, whether it's intentional or unintentional. So we may have to step outside of how we've been doing things. We're going to have to maybe dream bigger dreams, take bigger steps of faith, pray bigger prayers, and definitely weep a whole lot more over the losses of the people around us. This be the church emphasis, uh, where does it come from? It comes from the book of Acts. It's not new territory for many of you, but I want you to recognize this. And uh, our, our ministry staff has been working their way through the materials before you get it. We're already two weeks in to what you're going to be doing and starting in about three weeks. So we're working through this. And, you know, 
we, uh, we have found there is nothing so far that we have never heard before. But there's a difference between knowing something, hearing something, and doing something. There's a difference between knowing what you ought to do and doing it. And to be the church means you're engaged not just in, in filing away information, but something's happening in your life. So, in the Acts, the history book of the early church, what I love about that book is in the early chapters, we see the church that's just hitting on all cylinders. It is really rolling the way God designed it to roll. And I look at that and I say, man, I love our church. I've been here a long time. I have deep relationships with so many people. And, and, and I, love, I love the fellowship. I love to be with you. And it'd be easy for me to say, let's just pull up right here and enjoy this. It is, it is good to be here. But the world's a mess. And people are lost. And we can't just sit and, and allow that to happen without it, without it somehow touching our hearts. We are barely scratching the surface. And we need, we're adding disciples. We're not multiplying them. And we need to multiply at this point. There are a lot of churches struggling for all kinds of reasons. I'm f well familiar with church life, and I interact with a lot of pastors and all different sizes of churches, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Do you know why churches have problems? Because they're filled with sinful people. Like you. Like me. That's why churches have problems. But see, God, God puts us together because unless you're around people... Unless you're around people who are hard to love, you never really learn how to love. And unless you're around people that's hard to be patient with, you're never going to develop patience. Unless you have to take a step beyond what is comfortable for you, you're never going to learn about faith. And, and so God puts us together in these groups to grow, to become what he wants us to be. That's what a church is supposed to be about. So when, uh, when I think about the church, I think, well, yeah, Church is hard because it's full of messy people like me. But it's always true. There's nothing like the church when the church is working right. And uh, in, in getting ready for the sermon, so I know it's coming. And I just go out and I'm just doing my thing this last week. And God encouraged my spirit so much. Uh, we, we'll go weeks at a time. We, we don't have anybody in the hospital. And then we have a lot of stuff going on in our church. We'll go weeks at a time when things are rolling fairly well, and then there's crisis everywhere. And here's what I saw this last week. Just stepping into situations, people caring for one another in crisis. To walk into hospital rooms, to hear story, people reaching out to folks who are far from God. I had so many stories just this week. Just when the church starts working right, there is nothing like the church. Now, that's an Acts 2 church. When we talk about this, my favorite way of saying it, the people in Acts chapter 2, when the church is birthed, think, wow, what would it look like? There once existed a people. There once existed a people radically devoted to Christ, irrevocably committed to one another, and relentlessly dedicated to reaching their city and their world for Jesus Christ. And if... If God once worked in a people to accomplish that task, he can do it again. He's not done yet. We live in a time when we just can't settle for business as usual, I think. And the world around us says that. Uh, I, I will, prior to now about the time early voting starts and the Sunday before the election, I'll preach on those topics of our nation just now. But I'll tell you this just up front. I'm not going to endorse anybody. I, I don't, I'm never going to, if uh, I had to have the freedom that, oh, your tax exempt status won't be affected at all if you endorse somebody, I'm not endorsing any sinners for the President of the United States. And I'm always going to be voting for one. Uh, no matter who. So, we'll, we'll talk about those things, but there's not a Savior waiting for us in the political world. But there is a Savior. And that's where our focus needs to be. 
What our nation needs more than the right person in the right office. Our nation needs Jesus in the right place in the hearts of his own people. In the lives of his own churches. And we're going to focus on that in a big way. See, we, not business as usual. Normal isn't good enough. Normal isn't what Acts 2 talks about. Normal is not the radiant bride of Christ. Normal isn't beating back the gates of hell. We're called to build this community of faith here in vital union to God Almighty, in vital union to one another, in vital focus on the message of Jesus Christ. In our church, we say, because the Bible says, the church is the bride of Christ. Scripture says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. You wouldn't like it much if someone came up to you, we say. Someone came up to you and said, hey, let's go out and eat lunch after church today. I, but I appreciate if you leave your wife at home. I really don't like her at all. Well, I hope you husbands would be offended by that. If not, it's going to be trouble at home after lunch. Well, Jesus is going to be a little bit offended about that too. When you say, we love you, but we don't need your bride, which is how the Bible describes the church. Now, the Bible says the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of his body, the church. He gave his life to be her savior. You wouldn't take kindly to someone coming up to you and said, hey, I love you, man, but I can't stand to look at you, so I can't be with you. Christ is the head. The church is the body of Christ. And you can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't need, don't want, won't commit to his church. The Bible says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Talking about the church. Of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The Bible says Jesus died for the church. And the more spiritually mature you are, which spiritual maturity is not how much Bible knowledge you have. Nowhere is that declared in Scripture. It's how much you become more like Jesus. Are you doing something? It's not just, it's not the knowing. It's the being. How, how are you becoming more like the Savior? The more spiritually mature you are, the greater your love for the church will be. Because Jesus laid down his life for the church. I run into people from time to time who do say this. I, I'm looking for a perfect church like I've been visiting churches I ran to someone once I've been visiting we've been visiting for a while it's not really how long you've been in the area seven years I've been visiting churches for seven years you took a wrong turn at obedience to God somewhere because that's not right uh, it, it has to be different than, than that and and I and I do tell people when they seem to want a perfect church, well, please don't. If you find it, don't join it because you would ruin it. There, there are no perfect churches because they're filled with people like me and they're filled with people like you. And, and it's just people that are in the process of becoming what God wants them to be. And that's what we do together as a church. We encourage one another. And all the more as we see the day drawing near. So that's what a, a church is. And, you know, I've said, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was and God's not done with me yet. I am a person in process. And I'd say the same thing about our church family. I am not real, just real intense about most things. Uh, I'll, I'll eat whatever is set before me. I've been in situations and mission opportunities when I eat whatever is set before me. It doesn't phase me at all. I don't, don't have really uh, highly refined taste buds particularly, I guess. So I don't worry too much about what I eat. You've been looking at me now for several minutes. I don't care much about what I wear. Um, I, I follow sports enough to, enough to keep up. The guy said the other day, uh, you know, when I die, I want the Dallas Cowboys to, I, I want to have some of the Dallas Cowboys be Paul Bears at my funeral. So that, so that, when I die, they can let me down one more time. So, um, man. Um, but if you accuse me of being intense about the church, man, I'm intense about the church. 
I am all in for the church. And, and I'm, in, I'm in at our church because I love this church. But, but when my friend in northern Tanzania sent a picture of the new church that had been working with him to help start, and I saw a bunch of people standing under a big tree because that was church, and when it rains, they'll just get a black tarp and pull it between the branches of the tree so they can stand under it. I love that church too. Church is when God's people get together and seek to be more like Jesus and seek to not just do it together, but to get other people involved in it beyond themselves. That's the church, and I am intense about the church. And, and, I, and I hold to that axiom, I believe Jesus is the hope of the world, that, that the church is the hope of the world, because it is divinely born, directed, empowered, and I, I'll give the rest of my life to serving God through a local church. And it's, it's the hope of the world because God has entrusted the church, the only message that can change someone's eternal destiny. I love the church. And the church works, works right when God's people get the message right and really start, start living it, uh, being the church. So I love the church and... Again, I, I'm laying down the rest of my life as long as God gives me breath as, as faithfully as I can uh, to as many as I can whatever means I can until God calls me home to heaven I'm going to serve the local church in the New Testament uh, where we see churches there's no perfect churches there you know why? they're full of sinful people too and they had the same problems that churches have today personalities get conflicted with one another someone comes in with well, this makes sense to me, and people start following it, and it's not biblical, it's not true. Uh, different segments of the church don't really see themselves. I love my group, but I don't care about the rest of the church. It's, it's the same stuff. But I don't want this message to get lost. And what happens, two different segments that the message of a church, the focus of a church, the purpose of a church gets scrambled it is when maybe longtime churchgoers just forget what it's all about or don't know what it's all about. And, and it becomes all about them or it's lost to spiritual consumers who are only interested in looking after their own selfish agenda. But when I think about the church in Acts 2, I see they'd gotten past what we all have to get past for the church Top to bottom, start to finish, all of us together, we have to get to. And that spot is, it's not about me. And until the story stops being about you, the church doesn't work because church is an unselfish place. Church is a place of service. Church is a place of love. Not just what is, I, what is coming my way, but what can I do? Now, I know that when, for a lot of people, when the conversation stops being about them, they're no longer interested in the conversation. But we've been, we've been taught, I think, for too long in our country that we're the center of the universe, that everything should be evaluated based on its ability to meet our needs. The question we're trying to ask in these weeks just ahead, are you willing to give up your plans, your preferences, your agenda, your programming to see people come to know Christ? And are you willing to do something different than what you're doing now, explore, transition to reach people who are far from God with the message of Jesus Christ? And I'm not talking about uh, a laser light show and a fog machine and, and, and all those uh, things. That I'm talking about how you do relationships and how you think about your world and how you think about the body of Christ, your brothers and sisters here. These Acts 2 people were willing to try something beyond what they'd been trying. And I'd like to join them. So this is our message. And this is a sacred trust from God. So I want to take it and run with it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see those Acts 2 kind of results. So I want to challenge you to make a commitment as we seek. And commitments are how we grow. Make a commitment to seek to genuinely be the church. And I know that we, we do something like this and you say, well, why should we do this? Why should we do something different than what we're already doing? Why don't we just keep on doing what we've been doing? Because we'll keep getting what we've been getting. Because we are, we are fine-tuned to get the results we've been getting just now. So, so ask this, when was the, when was the per, on a personal level, when was the last time you took a next step with God? You did something beyond where you've been? 
something that you couldn't do without God, something that was uncomfortable for you? When was the last time you took a next step with God? Now, this is not, uh, well, I decided I would help with the offering, and I passed out an offering plate. You know, you could be a complete pagan and do that. Not that our guys aren't wonderful, godly guys. But that does not take a faith step. When was the last time you did something that required you to take a step of faith? Here's the other part. Your Bible fellowship group. And man, you have great, great things going on in a whole lot of groups just now. Let me ask you this. When was the last time... We'll do adult Bible fellowship groups. When was the last time an adult came to faith in Christ because of the united effort of your group? When was the last time somebody who was spiritually lost got saved because your group was praying and sharing and reaching out and they made a commitment of their life to Christ? When was the last time that happened in your group? You know, you may have been taking up God's, God's resources and air conditioning for nothing in your group for a while. So what can you do differently in that group to make that different? Because people all around us who we already know are going to hell and need Jesus. So what are we going to do that's different than what we've been doing? And be the church, I think, may give us a good catalyst to take some steps individually and as a group. We have some things to work on. And be the church. There are certain things that are just key things we need to grow in. Now, there's a devotional book. It has short daily devotions. These are short daily devotions, a couple of pages. Uh, there are scriptures each day that tie in with the devotion. There is a written prayer that may help to give you some, some wording to express your own heart to God about what you've just read. And there's an activity every day. And there's a little place to write down maybe a few things. So I've been doing this. And I, and yesterday, I finished my second week of the devotional book. And I have, I'm pretty intentional about my spiritual life, but I have found steps and I've found tangible things every day that I'm doing to change how I'm thinking about God and the things of God. You can do this too. Those books are going to be right out here on the, my left as you go out. Pick up a book today. There'll be other places. We, we wanted to start getting them out to you today. Don't start reading them yet. We'll do that in a couple of weeks, we'll start our readings, and we'll give you instruction on that. But devotional book. You know why? Because it tells you about what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a part of being, being the church, but also gets you in the habit of spending time with God every day. And truthfully, most people don't have a time where they hear from God's Word, where they think about what they're going to do about it. There's a tangible step, and they're taking a growth step that day. So the book will give you something and by the way when I say book I'm talking about it is a little bitty thing so it's a it's a great step next thing that commitment card talks about being in church there are five weeks of the of the core campaign I'm going to be leading up to it the next three uh, the next two after today but they're being faithful and consistent in church attendance that's a big deal uh, being in a group and if you're not in a group you're going to miss out on a lot of this because in, the, in, our, in our Bible fellowship groups, we're going to be breaking some of this out. And uh, what we will do is you're going to be reading about the topic, talking about it in your group. I'll be preaching about it at the end of that. And it's through those kind of steps that I pray we can take some big next steps as a church. We have found when we align our efforts, we're all pointed in the same direction at the same time. We do better and faster growing than any other times in the life of, in history of our church. And I want this to be one of those times. It's not just, oh, here's another study on something. And we do a lot of that where, well, here's another study on this topic. Here's another study on this uh, area of, of interest from the Bible. Uh, this is one to say, together, we want to be the church, not just go to church, not just attend church, not just be a member of a church. We want to be the church. And I want you to prayerfully Make some commitments about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a whirl. And just see what God might do. Not just in you, but in us. And I hope it's a whole lot different. And I hope it's a whole lot better. And I hope it's a whole lot more Christ-glorifying when we get to the end of the run. Let's stand and let's pray.